Oh, City Hope. Good to see you guys. Welcome to church. Welcome to Mobile Campus, Foley Campus, and everyone online. So glad you chose to join us. And we are, we're in a series uh, in the Psalms, and I've, I've got one that I've been assigned, so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to look into Psalms 91. Uh, if you have your Bible or a device, in fact, if you have a device, switch it over to the New King James Version. Now, this morning I picked up one of my dad's Bibles. I picked up the wrong one because he had one that has large print. <laughs> and even though I have contacts in, I couldn't read that if I had to, you know. So anyway, I'll, I'll use it in, in a minute, but uh, not to read from. Uh, my dad was a pastor for 60 years. One of the things that we remember about our dad is that uh, he loved the Word. And, of course, he would sit around in the living room reading. He always read out loud the Bible. But he had a bad habit when we were traveling. And this is probably before seatbelts. tells you how old I am. Yeah, he would put the Bible in the steering wheel and be driving and reading the Bible out loud. We, we, didn't, have, we didn't even have AM radio. We just had the Bible, you know, going forward. Uh, but I have several Bibles where he charted how many times that year he read through the Bible and all of the several Bibles and writing and things in it, there's writings in this. So it's very special. But I, I want to look at Psalms 91. And you, you understand that the Word of God has very specific things to say about difficult times, including the times we live in now. There is actually more prophecy uh, about the season of life you and I are living in than any other era of time. So if we understand what the Word says, we have clar clarity there, we'll have certainty about the future. So uh, I'm, I want you to understand that in this Psalms, the first 13 verses is the writer speaking to the Lord, and then verses 14 through 16, that is the Lord speaking back to the writer. So in verse 1, Psalms 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler or from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror of night nor of the army that flies by day nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you've made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways." In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Verse 14, now the Lord speaking back to the writer. Because he has set his love upon me, God, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Uh, I've read this psalm for years, <clears throat> and honestly, evil has come, plagues have come, and I have dashed my foot against the stone. So does that mean that this psalm isn't true? No, the promises are true. 
But I think we lack understanding in the things that we think we know. You probably have heard this psalm taught before. But I think we lack understanding because maybe there are things we don't know. So as we study this, I want you to suspend what you think about this psalm because I want you to get the clarity of what I'm wanting to say today from my heart. And, and what I want you to know is that there's not a better time to understand this psalm, Psalm 91. Psalm 91 was most likely written by Moses. It's a very, it's a very good illustration of Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme. In fact, what it does, it states a fact, or it states, makes a statement twice, but in different ways, slightly different ways. So Psalms 91 is an entire chapter of doubles, or you could say doublings. Uh, there, are 30, there are 30 things in 16 verses that double. So if you go through and you put these together and dissect this, you're able to see clearly and receive comfort. That's what's involved in Psalms 91 is comfort. You remember Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. The ideal he's making is a promise, and because he doubles it, he's emphasizing the fact this is a real thing that I intend to do. In verses 1 and 2 in Psalms 91 that we just read, there are three doublings. I just want to give you an example. These are not the ones I'm going to focus on. I'll give you an example. So we see, we see most high, God, and then we see almighty. That's two forms of his name. We see dwell and abide. They're not quite the same in their meaning, but they are a doubling of an idea. We get the same idea when we say both words. And then we have the secret place and the shadow. The, the reason, here is the reason God does this. He wants to give us a slightly different image of a promise. Why? Because then it's easier to wrap our minds around it. The, the ideal of doubling is the way God comforts us because we understand it. It's more clarity. And, and listen, God has never been surprised by any of the difficulties that arise against his people all through time. God has always had preparations ready for his people and warnings for his people. And many times we don't listen for those, so we don't, we're not prepared. But if we will listen, we'll be ready when, when things happen, when things come. And I'm not saying that if you, you'll never have any difficulties or come under any kind of pressure. But I will say this, it's not going to last forever. You're going to come through, and there will be a degree of normal returning, a new normal returning. And once you come through to the other side, you're better prepared for the things that are going to happen in the future. The, the, this won't be the last season of unpredictable events in our lives. And, and doubling, what it does, it established in this psalm, it, it goes all the way through it. What God wants you to know is that he's making concrete promises. The Western world, we, our thinking is very abstract. The, the Hebrews' thought was very concrete. So in order to nail things down, makes them under, more understandable, God communicates in concrete terms, if you will. Like, for instance, God's saying, I'm a rock. Well, that's an impregnable, unmovable rock, but he doesn't move, so you can trust in him. His teachings are the same. They don't waver. They're for the same, from one generation to the next generation. So in order to nail things down and make them more understandable, God communicates in concrete terms. And that's why the verses where he compares himself the things in our natural world, it helps us wrap our mind around the promises that he's giving us. For example, in verse four, the first part of it, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. So here's what he's doing. Of all, the whole animal world, he's giving us a picture of the one who's more determined to protect its young than any creature on the face of the earth. And that's a mother hen. And you think, well, what about a grizzly? What about a mother grizzly? Well, she's at the top of the food chain. Rarely does she have to come in contact with anything that's stronger than she is. The reason the mother hen will likely have to die to protect her chicks is that anything that gets in the chicken coop can, can take the mother hen out. She'll have to give up her life. This picture of a mother hen is slightly, it's a different picture of God's care, but we see it in Jesus. What did he say? He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the, the prophets and stones those that are sent to her. How often I would gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So here's what he's doing. He promises us he'll give us his life if necessary. He did. He died for his people because he cares for them. God genuinely cares for you. The last part of verse 4, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Now, this verse says, I will protect you. That's the shield. You've got that imagery. That's defense. 
But then he says a buckler. A buckler is something that's going to surround you. And that, that when you put the armor on, you're going to be surrounded with a buckler. So God shows himself as this amazing warrior who has the ability to protect you and a buckler that nobody can possibly overcome. So here, let's fast forward and let's get the images of this today. Okay? So a mother hen. You, you could say a mother hen is, it was kind of like you know, a caring grandmother. And maybe you didn't have a caring grandmother. But a mother, a caring mother, or a caring grandmother, that they're not strong, but they make up for it in their care and their compassion for you. I mean, they will fight for you spiritually, a grandmother, or, you know, that, that's going to stand up for you. And then the other image is like a warrior. So whoever you're, whoever you're, greatest fan of, of fighting, a boxer or whatever, that, that's that warrior image. So if you're walking through spiritual darkness, you want someone with the heart of a grandmother and with the ability of a mighty warrior. God's telling us, I'm going to help you. I do care about you. And if you can wrap your mind around this, your fears and worries will go away. His protection, what I've just said, is in the revelation of his truth. The, the verse said, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. In other words, if you're not mindful of the truth of God's word, you will be just as fearful as a person who knows nothing about God. The key to being free from fear is what you know of God's proof. The key of being free from fear is what you know about God's proof. The mistake most of us make, we think in order for God to work, he has to deal with everything negative. So God, you take all the negatives away and th then I can have peace. So, okay, I, I can have peace because there's a vaccine now for a virus. I, I can have peace now because now I can travel without a mask. I can have peace now because, you know, NFL's back up and running and you know, baseball's running and this and that. You know, I, I can have peace with all of that. The economy was doing great. I can have peace with that. God is trying to communicate to us in this psalm that it is possible for you to have peace even when things are not normal. Even when things are not normal and changing every day. I don't know if you know this or have noticed this, but things are not normal and things are changing every day. And may, maybe you don't know that, but, but I'm just telling you, that, that's what's going on. I'm not saying it's always easy, but you can have the reality of God's promise even when circumstances don't look great. A lot of people give up. They fall because they're so dependent upon their feelings. We are a feeling people. It's based on my feelings. So we, we give up, we give in because of our feelings. This, you know, this won't be right until I feel. I can't trust my feelings. This is, this is not right until I'm feeling it's right or until I have the assurance I'm going to be taken care of. There are going to be times in your life the only place you're going to find assurance is from God's word. You put your fears away and trust God. Many believers think to have God's peace, you don't have to fight for it. It's like walking under a tree that has ripe fruit, it just falls. And there you go, it's in your hands. Peace has to be obtained through some kind of a spiritual fight. Do you hear me? Walking through the doors doesn't naturally give you peace. You're gonna have to fight for peace. You know, be, being part of a church doesn't automatically give you peace. You're gonna have to fight for peace. First Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Now, let's go back to Psalms 91. Moses, in Psalms 91, remember who he is. He's a type of Christ. He's the leader, getting the Hebrew people out of slavery for over 430-something years. He brings them out. He's a leader, and, and he, he's writing this psalm. So a lot of this, and we're, we're not getting into all of it. We don't have the time. But a lot of this is referring back to that, that exodus, the 10 plagues. So here he is in this Psalms 91, and twice he uses the word pestilence. We know there were 10 plagues. Of the 10 plagues, two were pestilence. Pestilence is, is a, in the Hebrew, that word, it means a mysterious way of death. So there were two of what we call the plagues that were death, death to the firstborn animal, death to the firstborn child of the Egyptians. The rest, listen, the rest we would call plagues, not pestilence. Why? Because you could live through them. 
We, we don't have anything written that says somebody died because the, the river was full of blood or the frogs were out or the lice were out or, the, you know, or, or, or all these different things that happened. Now, it was uncomfortable. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting. It was a hardship. You know, it, it was like wearing a mask all the time. It was like being locked up in your house and you can't go outside. I mean, it was inconvenient. It wasn't comfortable, but it wasn't killing anybody. So it's ironic, or it's actually Moses specifically by the Holy Spirit is putting this in here because what we're gonna see is we're gonna see this word pestilence, it always generates fear. The word pestilence always produces fear. I, I think there's three challenges that we face today as people of God. We face the fear of disease. You know, it seems like every month there's, there's this new disease, there's this new thing that's going around. And, and then we face the fear of finances. And, and because of the last couple of years, finances have been an issue and, and the economy and inflation, all this stuff, so we have this fear of finances. And then, then we face this tormenting fear. Let me tell you what tormenting fear is. It's that everything's gonna fall apart. And that's in the back of our minds. Some of us, it's in the front of our minds, but it's like everything's gonna fall apart. I don't believe that totally. Here's what I believe. I believe we're in the days before the second coming of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. I believe we're living in the end times. Jesus said in those days it would be exactly the way it was in the days of Noah. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. To me, that means as a continuing economy right up to the time of his return. He, Jesus said it's going to be like a thief in the night. So life will be somewhat normal, not, not, not in a period of a worldwide crisis because, oh, there's a worldwide crisis. We're looking for that. It's going to happen. No, things are going to kind of be normal. So let, let me go back and give you an example of this. When Saul was the king of Israel, he compromised in sin. When he did, darkness came in his life. He lost the anointing. So Satan takes advantage of that, and he comes in to attack the people of Israel. You understand that Satan does not like you, and he, but he can't destroy you. The, his biggest tool of influence on you is fear. So what did he do? He came into a people group who happened to be God's number one enemy in the Old Testament, this group of Philistines. And so he comes, and what he does, he, he comes in and uses them to produce fear. What do they do? Well, they go down to the valley of Elan. They stand on the mountainside opposite of the people of Israel. Then they use their champion giant Goliath who comes out every day for 40 days and two times every day, what does he do? He yells out across the valley so every Israelite can hear with his big voice. He yells out curses on God's people. This giant is speaking curses on God's people and God's people are doing absolutely nothing. It's like they've got their head stuck in the sand. They're intimidated. They're fearful. They don't know what to do. Their leader has sin in their lives. Their leader has darkness in their lives and he's not gonna go out and fight. He's the one by rank who should go out to fight the giant. The giant says, listen, if somebody can, if somebody can come take me out, then, then the Philistines will serve you and then if, you, you know, if I take you out, you're gonna serve us. All of these threats, he using fear against the people. Now, here's something. I want you, I want you to notice this, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. I, I didn't notice this a couple of weeks ago, but I, the giant really didn't want to fight. The Philistines really didn't want to fight. King Saul didn't want to fight. The Israelites didn't want to fight. So what was Satan's plan? Satan's plan was to simply use fear to stop people, to paralyze people. It, it, his, his plan was to get people to do nothing as the giant keeps speaking curses over God's people. The people aren't doing anything. Leadership's not doing anything. There's a darkness of sin in his heart, and so nothing's going on. And, and so when you understand how God works, you, you, listen, when you understand how God works, his first mission when trouble comes, the trouble has come to the Israelites. Here's, here's the Philistines and here's this giant. When trouble comes, his first mission is not to stop the trouble. His first mission is when trouble comes is to take the fear out of your heart and your mind because the fear is gonna paralyze you. You can't do anything to get rid of the fear. We right now are a fearful people. There's so much fear going on 
in, in, in our country and people and lives. And I don't know if anyone's ever told you this. I have probably said this, especially to my kids. I've ever had someone tell you, don't be afraid. You know, don't be afraid. And dads, we're real good at this. The kid comes to the bed, he's scared. Don't be afraid, buddy. Suck it up, buttercup. Go back to bed. You see, it's a good thought, but if you can't tell me how not to be afraid, you haven't helped me. I'm here today to tell you how not to be afraid. Do you hear me? Yes. I'm here today on a mission to tell you how not to be afraid. Because I'm telling you, the enemy will take advantage of every situation to plant fear in our lives so that we don't do anything. We stand still, we don't move, we don't speak, we're not, we're not advancing. So let's go back to Psalms 91, verse one. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Listen, this is a habit you have to develop. This is not something you do occasionally when things are bad or you're scared or you're about to lose your job. The ideal is that you dwell in the secret place of the Most High and you're, you're, you understand that you're talking about regular time with God. Being in his word in that secret place with God. You separate yourself from the busyness of life. You leave your computer and your phone out of that secret place and you go in so you can totally focus on your God. And listen, we're all the same. Everyone listening to me, every campus, everyone online, we're all the same in the fact that when it comes to sitting down and reading the Bible or praying, so many thoughts come into our mind. I'm the only one. Anybody else? Thoughts come into your mind? Good thoughts, negative thoughts. And, and, and you understand that some thoughts are not so good. Why? Because they produce fear and worry. And you start to worry, you start to be fearful. But when you know the truth that God made, how God made us, when you know that how God made us, that he created us, that we have the ability to, char to take charge over our mind. You do. You have the ability to take charge. You need to learn how to do that. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to receive from God properly. Jesus said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Let me illustrate it this way. You hear someone's story. They have a dilemma. They have a crisis going on and you hear how God they trusted in God and they even said this is the verse that we leaned on we stood on and God said us he came through for us and, and and you hear the verse you don't pay a lot of attention to it time goes on and then a crisis or circumstances hit your house your family and you go back to that verse well, I'm gonna use that verse that's the verse they used but it doesn't work for you why not because the verse is not planted in your heart you haven't abided in the presence of Almighty with the word of God and get it imparted into your heart because the promises of Psalm 91 are conditional. The promise belongs to those who have a regular habit of trusting and dwelling in God. And we know this, everybody, everybody should have a regular habit of trusting in God. So when pestilence equals fears come, your heart is prepared. They're going to come. They're not going to stop coming. And just when you think you've seen it all, you're going to see it again. You've got to be more focused on God's word than you are the events that are troubling you. Amen. You've got to be more focused on what God said and his promises than what a politician says, what a president says, what, what a group of people say about this or that. You've got to be standing on what God's word says. And if you don't, here's what's going to happen. You're going to allow fear to come in. You're going to be paralyzed, frustrated. Fear, what it does, it begins to manipulate and change your emotions and your feelings. And all of a sudden there's anger and there's rage and there's hate. And all these things are going on. Why? Because it all started with fear and that's why the enemy uses fear. We have to learn to be focused on God's promises. Not just have something stuck on the refrigerator with the promises of God, but they're stuck in my heart. And, and, and then we can learn that even in times of trouble, we can have peace because God's word said it. And that's where P 
peace is the most real. It's from God's word. So here's the question. How do you learn to have the abiding peace in your heart when trouble reigns and more trouble's on the way? I'm, I promise you, until Jesus returns, there's more trouble on the way. There's more chaos, more crazy, all this stuff. So how, what do we do? How, how do we, how do we ab- have abiding peace? You must establish and maintain your focus on God's word with your mouth. Buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> Psalms 91, 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him I will trust. In each verse, there are doublings. I've already told you that. Many are given in order. One, two, three. This verse, verse two, they're in reverse order. Three, two, one. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. Saying and trusting. The Lord, my God. Refuge, fortress. When you line it up and it's paired off right, trust and saying are together. So if you're not saying God's word, then how can you trust God's word? If you wanna be able to trust God's word, then you have to say God's word. So Psalms 91 is written in a way that it says, I will say of the Lord. So when you're in times of trouble, when there's a giant threatening you, when there's something cursing you, and you wanna hear God's voice, you want God to speak to you. I mean, I've had so many, oh, I wish God would speak to me. I wish God would make it so clear to me. Well, he has. He laid out his wisdom in this book called the Bible. God is talking to you. And listen, it's not enough to just read it. You need to hear it. In other words, God wants to talk to me, but not audibly speaking to me. So I'm going to give voice to God through his word. His living word will speak to me. And when I I read it and then I read it out loud, I'm not just reading in my mind. I'm speaking it out loud. And now the atmosphere around me, I'm hearing it again. I'm speaking it again. And all of a sudden, it's going to come alive inside of me. And it's going to be planted in my heart. So the next time a giant is cursing me, I'm not going to get all wigged out, freaked out, and go off the end. I'm going to stand on God's word and say, no way, giant. (laughs) When I say God's word with my mouth, I'm giving my heart the the same thing as if God were speaking to me. But I'm gonna be honest with you. Many of God's children have no reverence for his word. It's outdated, it's old school, it's insignificant. Let's read so many watered down versions that it just makes real nice reading. They put more value in their own feelings than they do in what God has said. If you'll put more value in what God has said than you do talking about what everything else is going on, you will see yourself change. Because you cannot put this in you without it changing you. You can't put this in you without it convicting you. You can't put this in you without it showing you the truth and the truth will set you free, not what somebody else said. Are y'all listening to me? So if you're, going to be, if you're going to be a believer that gives in to fear in time of trouble, you've got to learn to focus on the value of God's word. And the only way you're ever going to get that done is to say God's word out, out loud. Watch. This is how you do this. Your mind will race with distractions and there's only one way to slow it down. Your tongue. And don't tell me you don't know what that means. Your tongue has been designed by God to capture your mind. And everything God designs, the enemy comes in with, a, with another version of it to pervert it. So God, your tongue's been designed by God to capture your mind. Your tongue can cause your mind to slow down and focus when you begin to speak. You can't be thinking of something and then saying something totally different at the same time. You will bring your mind to the words of your mouth when you begin to speak God's word. And if you'll speak God's word more than you speak everybody else's word, you're you're gonna see how you can get a grip on your mind. 
and fear's not gonna tantalize your mind because you know it does. You know our minds race with things and distractions of what's gonna happen. How's this gonna happen? The economy, all this stuff. What are we doing? We're falling right into the trap that the enemy's planted just like against Israel. And that's why he tells us, trust God? How do I trust God? By saying, saying his word. I'm not talking to you, I'm not telling you to go down the street and start, you know, if God tells you to, okay. I'm talking about in your private time. I'm talking about in that, that, that refuge and that shadow where you're gonna be. Start saying it out loud. Start believing it. And when you're not completely, and, and I promise you this, listen to me. When you start doing that, you're not gonna understand everything the word says. You're not, the light's not gonna click on the first time you read Psalms 91. It's not gonna do it. But over time, it starts to change you. It, you start, it, it starts changing you from the inside out. You start having revelation and insight to what that word really means. It's not some cute little thing we put on a bumper sticker. So, you know, we, we, nobody gets it the first time. It's a process. You're learning, you're growing, it's a habit. Let me help you kickstart it. You ready? Yeah. Let me help you kickstart it. Yeah. Verse two, let's, let's read it out loud. Ready? I will say of the Lord. My Lord, where are y'all? <laughs> what group is this? All right, you ready? Let's say it together. Ready, go. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Yes. <clears throat> Watch. Watch the double. The Lord is everybody's, but my God is not everybody's. A lot of people know about the Lord but don't know him as my God. What happens when you begin to say this, you bring the Lord your God into a very personal place in your life. A relationship begins to develop and then something happens. See, this is not some religious exercise I'm giving you. Here's what happens. Most of the information we receive in this life is through our five physical senses, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling, all of those feed info into the brain. And so. Here, here's how God created us. It's in the scripture. I'm, not going, I'm, I'm gonna just tell you what it says. It's in the scripture. You are a spirit, you possess a soul, you live in a body. You are a spirit. Your spirit will live forever in one of two places. And that's your decision. So how do we receive information into our spirit? Through the word of God and by the Holy Spirit, he drops his word into my spirit and then here's what happens. As I put it in my spirit, it goes through this reasoning process in my soul. What's my soul? My mind, my will, and my emotions. In this reasoning process, when I start putting it in there, I start reading Psalms 91 every day. I just start making it a habit. That's going in. And it gets into a reasoning process in my soul. And then guess what happens? It, revelation, the Holy Spirit starts bringing. And then all of a sudden, my soul starts to change a little bit. My mind starts thinking a little differently. My emotions become more stable. I'm not wrapped up in fear and feelings. All of a sudden, I'm changing from the inside out. And yes, we are using seeing and hearing but it's a different sense, it's a deeper sense. It's like Jesus said, who ha he who has ears, well, m you know, most people have ears, let him hear, okay? But see, he, he said, this is a double operation. This, this has a double meaning too. So he's saying when you hear God's truth, it has another meaning to it. There's three tiers, three levels to God's word. And you want to get to all three levels so it speaks to you. So you're hearing sounds audibly when you read the word out loud, but at the time you're hearing in your spirit. Your spirit is catching this and there's convincing taking place. And that's where your beliefs come from. Listen, you can argue with me all day long. You can stand on this. But if it's against what this word says, my belief is so strong in what this word says, you'll never convince me to change it. Do you hear me? Are you that strong? Are you in that place where you believe what this says regardless of what anybody else says or anybody else does? 
When you do, your beliefs are strong. So when the giant comes and threatens you and wants to attack you with words, <laughs> that's not what my God says about me. That's not how God looks at me. That's not how God teaches me. That's not how God loves me. That's not what God did for me. It's a lie, and guess what? Then I'm not affected by all the giants and their tactics. Now I am, and, and listen, here's the deal. I'm getting prepared for the next one. It ain't a one and done. I'm getting ready for the next giant. I don't even know that. I don't even know what the next giant is, but there's another giant coming. So when I do this one, I'm prepared for the next one. And, and you remember, G Jesus said this about Thomas. You remember Thomas. He wasn't there when Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after the resurrection. And they told him, and he said, well, I'm not gonna believe till I can put my fingers into his wounds. And Jesus shows up. He says, hey, put your fingers in the wounds of my hand. Put your hand in the side wound. And then he says, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, you've believed because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not yet seen, but have believed. Blessed, I haven't seen all of this. It's in my spirit, it's in my beliefs. I believe it and God says, I'm gonna bless you folks. I'm gonna bless you because you believe and you haven't seen, you haven't touched. He's talking about the ability to believe what God said when you see no physical evidence. How do you do that? It's communicated through the word of God. The Bible says with the heart man believes, not your head or your mind. So there's something imparted to your heart in order for it to have the capacity to believe. So that's what the word of God says. Let, let's go back and kick start this thing again. Verse two, come on, say it with me out loud. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. When you're saying it, you're trusting. If you're not saying it, you're not trusting. These are difficult days we're going through. God allows all of these things to happen. Stay with me. Sometimes we think, well, if God was really working in our lives, we'd never come into these circumstances. That's not true. God will permit an agent of fear, a Goliath, to bring challenges in order to change, for one thing to happen. He, this darkness is in King Saul. He allows Satan to use the Philistines. He allows them to use Goliath. All of this is to do what? what? What's God looking for? To raise up Davids and show the world his Davids. <laughs> Goliath cursing Israel, 80 curses. David comes along, he hears this. He says, I'm not giving in to this. Bible says he's full of confidence. He goes to King Saul, he says, oh yeah, I've kept my father's sheep, I'm a servant, but the bear and the lion come along, I destroyed them, the Lord delivered me, this Philistine, next time he pops up against God's people, the Lord's gonna deliver us. In times of trouble, nobody ever rises to the occasion. I mean, we've heard that, rise to the occasion. In time of trouble, no one that rises to the occasion, we always fall to the level of our preparation. The reason David was able to do what he did is because of what he's been doing all along. Since a kid, he's been in the fields, serving his father with sheep, singing, writing songs, looking to the stars, having special time with God in the shadow under the covering of the feathers. I mean, th this is part of his life. He, he's so prepared. So when you read about David killing Goliath, 1 Samuel 17, you, you, you're, here's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see there's more given to what David says to Goliath than what he did to Goliath. This is saying, trusting. He, David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies you have defiled, oh, by, by the way, giant, the armies, you, the armies you've been defiling, cursing, uh, they have a God, and I come, to him, I come to you in his name, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. We're gonna continue to have giants in our world until Jesus returns. So what do we do? Develop a secret place. Start with reading Psalms 91. I mean, you can read anything you want in the scripture, but Psalms 91, Psalms 23, all these songs. So start reading them out loud. And like David, when giants show up, because we've been doing this all along, we're able to say, oh, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And the Lord will deliver your mind from fear and panic.
So I hope you understand my heart. And let me expand my heart a little more before we close the message. All of you know that this week the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, which eliminated the right to an abortion an abortion nationwide. And going forward, this allows states to determine abortion rights on their own. Now listen to me, stay with me. This is good news for those of us who are pro-life. Many have been praying for the unborn for the past 50 years and we're thankful to God and we praise God for this huge win for life. However, this win is not a time to boast and brag This win is a time to shine a bright light in our world. In fact, this light will be so bright that people will see the works of the church. Millions of children will be born. Many of them will grow up in poverty. Some of them will be born to single moms and struggling to make ends meet. These parents, these moms will need help. This is another giant. But the church, we need to seize the opportunity to really be the church, not some denomination, not some religious organization, but the church of the living God. So instead of being boastful or being in anger or being mad, all these things, are you ready to stand in the gap for women who face unplanned pregnancies? Are you open to fostering children or adopting children? Are you prepared to volunteer at your community crisis pregnancy center? Church, we have an incredible opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to hurting women and children. And I want you to know something. Through the scripture, you know this, but I'm gonna remind you, through the scripture, those who love children and bless them, that's special to Jesus. Those who take care of widows, you know, we, we used to use it, the, the poor, the orphan, and the widow. When we, when we have that, we have the heart of Jesus. When we have that heart, and we're, we're feeding ourselves with the word, and we're growing, and, and we're, we're learning how to overcome obstacles and giants, but we have that word, and we start operating in that light, the whole world will notice. See, in my generation, we were looking for an external revival with a a named evangelist to come in and do this and do that and set the world aflame. And maybe that happened in some regions. But today, the church of the living God, we have the opportunity. If you are a believer, we have the opportunity to let the love in the heart of Christ shine so that the whole world sees it not argue, not debate, not, 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 not get sideways and frustrated and mad. No, 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 no. Go into that secret place. Go into the word. Because listen, as a church, we do need to praise God because human life is dear and precious to God. We need to be thankful for the reversal of injustice and, and saving countless lives. We need to have empathy. We, we, you know, we will not relish over opposing views and women across the nation who feel anger and fear and hopelessness today because we're, we're called to provide hope to these people. In action, we celebrate the life saved, but we're determined to care and protect life and do what we can to help. I mean, we can get excited at the drop of a hat of going to another nation on the other side of the world and helping the poor, the orphan, and the widow. Now it's in our back door. Now it's time for the church to be the church. I, and I don't know how many people came up to me, and I'm not telling you to do this, but I, I'm just telling you, these were, these were people that came up to me and said, thank you. I said, you're welcome. I don't know what they were going to say, but you, 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 it, the, the pride leaked out. I, I don't have pride over this anymore. I'm like, bless God, we did this, and we've done that. Now we need to give thanks and praise to God. We don't need to be prideful about this and, and gloat and, and rub this in. It's, it's time to be the opposite. It's time to have that empathy and love on people and do it because this is, God, God's not surprised by all this and he prepares and has given what we need to do it. We just have to do it. And, and listen, I, I know if, and if you don't agree with me, I respect the right for you to have your own opinion and it'd be wrong. I, I'm just, but 
I'm just telling you. This is God's heart. Do you know God loves everybody? Doesn't matter what nation, what color. He loves everybody. He created them. He's the God that created them. So why wouldn't he want us to love people that are hurting in fear and are in a, in a, in a difficult time because they have a child and they can't afford this. It wasn't planned and all and all this instead of doing what the church used to do, make them feel bad and condemned. It's not that time, folks. Listen, when Jesus comes, I want to be on the, I want to be on the end of helping and loving and nurturing people, not on the other side of it, pointing my finger at people and condemning people because Jesus is not about condemnation. He's about love, mercy, and grace. Y'all okay? Still love me? You got to if you go into heaven. I wanna pray for you. Can I pray for you? Lord, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for giving us the ability to arrest our mind and reel it in. But we have to take that habit and develop it to get into that place alone, to get into that place with the word and be alone with you and let your word do what only your word can do so that we can affect not only our family, but the families in our community. Lord, I pray your blessings on this word and let no giant, no thief steal the seed of this word that has been imparted to your people today. In Jesus' name, let us be the church alive. Amen. Thank you so much for watching and being a part of City Hope. And listen, uh, if you feel like you need to take a step. Maybe it's a decision to follow Jesus or, or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life. Or maybe it's even just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. So right now, there's a QR code coming up on our screen. Follow the link and give us the opportunity to connect with you. Because if we know anything, it's that content alone is never gonna help you uh, find the life change that God has for you. So look, give us the opportunity to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you and help you grow and be a part of our church. But we love you. Can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope.